It's Friday, April 19th. Good Friday, the full pink moon. I meant to record this story about a Hungarian witch and my Hungarianness from my Hungarian father on Tuesday, but my father died on Tuesday. So needless to say, this won't be my best performed or best edited episode, but I wanted to finish it and I want to dedicate it to the memory of my Hungarian father. Problematic, powerful. Szeret like Edishapa. Warning. We discovered during our research that Z Budapest has been labeled and embraced the label of TERF. For those of you not familiar with this acronym, it stands for Trans Exclusive Radical Feminist, and it basically denotes a feminist who doesn't accept that trans women are women. We at Missing Witches are not that. Inclusivity is our mandate and our guiding principle, so we were a bit shook by this discovery. After some discussion, we realized we had three choices. We could ditch the episode, we could go ahead with the story but sweep that stuff under the rug, or we could use this platform to respectfully disagree and tell this story as a way to start a conversation not just about gender, but also about what we do when we find rot amid the ancestors' bones we've been collecting. In the spirit of safe spaces of all kinds, we want to make Missing Witches as safe as we can. A place where we can talk about issues from a core ethic of radical compassion, where it's safe to ask questions, make mistakes, or respectfully disagree. Learn. Grow. Change our minds. Change the world. Recognize how experience shapes point of view. We want to name and shame the failings of our ancestors, but retain the ability to separate the toxic from the healing. Our goal is to learn from their missteps, why they happen, and do better without throwing away the valuable lessons they have to teach. As Leila Saad wrote, the loftier goal is to help us become better ancestors for those who will come after us. And, as Michelle the Birch Trail taught us, call in before you call out. So this is us, Z, calling in. You aren't being a proper woman, therefore you must be a witch. You must be a witch. This story got very personal for me very fast. I read that in the aftermath of the Hungarian Revolution, Zsuzsana Budapest walked from Hungary to a refugee camp in Austria. And in the aftermath of the Hungarian Revolution, my father had walked from Hungary to a refugee camp in Austria. And it's possible that this witch may have walked beside my father on that traumatic road. And maybe they made eye contact. And maybe there was comfort in that. It makes me feel connected to her in the same way I feel connected to my own family. Those whom I love, despite their shady politics and clashing personalities. See, I'm a child of a not-altogether friendly divorce, so I've had to contend with a lot of bad-mouthing. My parents were constantly talking contradictory smack about each other. But in a way, it kind of did me a favor because I learned early to make up my own mind, to do my own research and draw my own conclusions. Also, to accept the good and do my best not to dwell on the bad, snatching the teachable from the jaws of the traumatic. All this to say, Zsuzsana Budapest could very easily have been my aunt. In fact, her brother and my father were both named Imre. So I'm approaching this story the way we all do, with distant and problematic relatives at weddings or funerals. Agree on some issues. Speak up when we disagree on others. Connect based on what we have in common and what we admire about problematic Auntie Juju. Once you hear her name, you don't stop seeing it. She pops up constantly in feminist documentaries and witchy reading lists. As a lesbian radical feminist, she lit up the 1970s, manifesting the witch as author, activist, journalist, playwright, and songwriter. She is iconoclast, tongue-in-cheek, having faced both, in my view, legitimate detractors and zealotous protesters. I mean, she was arrested for doing tarot readings and took that battle to the California Supreme Court. Lover or hater, Z Budapest is a firebrand, and contemporary witchcraft has felt her heat. In her autobiography, My Dark Sordid Past as a Heterosexual, 
Budapest recalls driving to a speaking engagement and passing rows of demonstrators bearing placards with phrases like, death to the witch. She wrote, I had been invited to the library to give a lecture about the goddess. My need for political freedom had brought me from Hungary to the United States. My desire for religious freedom brought me to the goddess, the cure for the fear of God, a cure that I have been talking about to anyone who will listen ever since. But to a lot of people, the very concept of the great goddess is the greatest heresy and the greatest threat to male domination of women. Once women discover what has been taken from them, they want to reclaim her. When women know their goddess, it is impossible to enslave them. Once again, I was being hunted. Do we even need to recite the Ipsita Roy Chakraverti quote at this point? Let's hear it instead. Every strong woman is a witch and is hunted. Budapest continues. The library had noticed that teenagers were taking out a lot of books about witchcraft, and one of my sisters who worked there suggested they invite me to come down from Oakland so that the kids could talk to a, quote, real witch. To generate some interest, the library photocopied a picture of a black cat from the Holy Book of Women's Mysteries with the words witchcraft and goddess lecture, the time and date and my name. It was supposed to be humorous, not scary, but when one boy took a copy home to his militant Christian mother, all hell broke loose. Her minister thought it was a splendid opportunity for a crusade against Satan. Well, it turned out that many saw this as an opportunity. The 700 Club, a Christian television show, organized buses to bring in protesters from all over Northern California to this little library. Budapest wrote, Their hatred was a potent weapon. By definition, I was evil, and it was God's will to destroy me. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, one of the posters proclaimed. To them, I was not a human being, but a dehumanized witch. Much easier to hate. Zhuzhana Budapest was born in 1940 to a long line of nasty women. Her mother was a sculptor of goddesses. Her granny, Iona, was a suffragette who gave motivational speeches and wrote for the National Women's Paper, preaching women's liberation before women had the vote. In Summoning the Fates, a generational women's guide to destiny and sacred transformation, Budapest wrote, During the Hungarian Revolution of October 1956, I was on my way to a demonstration. When you were 16, being part of a collective uprising is very exciting. When I finally crossed the bridge, I heard shots. That wasn't too unusual. It was a revolution and people had been shooting off guns in celebration for days. But when I turned the corner to the plaza, everything was silent. Too silent. Instead of a crowd of cheering, shouting people, the plaza was covered with bodies. All those who had made it to the plaza on time had been shot down. The blood was still dripping on the stones. I stood stock still realizing that I had indeed arrived too late. Too late for the massacre. In Hungarian, the fates are Shorj Istenok, the destiny goddesses. But their Latin name, the Parkai, means those who spare. And indeed, my life was spared by them that day. My father's skewed take on the revolution was heartbreaking in his retelling. He ha had dementia, so I'm working with the memories he has lost, searching for snippets of old conversation and bowls of chicken paprikash. He once told me the Hungarian revolutionaries managed to rise up, free political prisoners, hold down the Russian army. They called out to the rest of the world, Come and help us. We have them, but we can't hold them down for very long. Come, help us out. And no one came. No one came and no one helped. So the revolutionaries, mostly university students, the young, bright future of Hungary, exhausted and outmatched, fled or were killed. At least that's how my father told it. And I think maybe a hint of that bitterness and distrust made its way into my blood and manifested in an unwillingness to ask for help. It's infinitely easier to struggle alone than to ask for help and be ignored. Budapest writes, In our family, being a Hungarian was the religion. 
You had to know your history, honor ancient feuds and treaties, and revel in being a Magyar. This was the best and most cursed of all nations one could get born into, but also the most magical. Situated at the crossroads between the steppes of the East and the nations of the West, we had regularly been overrun by bigger nations. I had to laugh when I read this. I heard that message growing up so many times. It was a point of pride that Hungary had been overrun so many times, but the language, the country, still existed. Hungarian Hungarians persisted. And maybe there's something there that informs Budapest's abject stubbornness, for better and for worse. My mom was born in southern Ontario, my father is Hungarian, his second wife was from Venezuela, and my husband was born in Scotland. And we live in the woods of Quebec. So there's no room for nationalism in this family, but it's crazy that my life as it is exists at all. So I often wonder, is it fate? Or just a single random end point in the chaos of dispersion? Maybe people with this location in their blood contend more with the notion of providence than those with a clear and local history? And maybe in that way, being forced to leave her homeland fueled Budapest's repeated consideration of destiny. She wrote, What rules our lives? Is it chance or choice or something else? Is it the stars or that strange force people call Lady Luck or Fortuna? Since the beginning of time, people have tried to figure out what determines their destiny. In Hungary, we have a saying, Ember tervesh isten veges. Humans plan. God finishes. But the fates are beyond even goddesses and gods. They are raw forces of nature. They are rhythms of the ebb and flow of energy, matter, and meaning, the three basic components of the universe. They were here first. They will stay to the last. Again, maybe it was being forced to leave, but being Hungarian and these northern, eastern European roots come up in her writing often. She is so fiercely Hungarian that she named herself after its capital city. Born Zsuzsana Emze Moksi, she took the name Budapest and has worn it as a badge of honor, defiance, and persistence. She wrote, In Northern Europe, we also find three maidens who sit beside a well in a deep cavern. This original model of the three sisters is the source for all other triple goddesses, such as Hecate, who stands at the triple crossroads, her faces looking in three directions, the past, present, future, and Triple Brigid, who appears as a healer, a goldsmith, and a lady of inspiration. It is the pattern for the trinities of Maiden, Mother, and Crone, and all the other goddesses who have three aspects. Each of the many components of our human existence required the goddess to show a separate face and attributes. Eventually, the original trinity becomes 10,000 aspects, each with her own name, each still harking back to the beginning, the middle, or the end of the life cycle, which the three fates rule. When we summon the fates, we call them out from their deep hiding place in the unconscious. We draw them slowly into the conscious mind, illuminated by goodwill and understanding. This eternal magic can transform the powers that rule us from the misunderstood three hags into the wonderful three graces. Or at least we hope so. There are no guarantees with this force, but there are certain practices, a kind of etiquette of interaction with the fates that have worked for people before. We call it the technology of the sacred. Sacred means that we are speaking not of a technology of machines, but of souls. We behave differently and do unusual things to relate to an unseen divine force. Prayer, for example, is such a sacred technology. Creating sacred space is another. Traveling between the worlds in meditation is one as well. And blessings and curses are others. As they learned about the likes and dislikes of the fates, people created ways to talk to them. When you mention their names, you should always show a great deal of respect. The fates live in each DNA cell in our bodies. This is why they can hear everything, everywhere. In Austria, Z finished high school and attended the University of Vienna on a scholarship. Landing in the United States in 1959, Budapest studied in Chicago, where she met and married Tom, the father of her children. After her two sons were born, Z started using birth control and told this to a priest during confession. The priest flew into a rage and told her that this was an unforgivable sin. 
Budapest wrote, This sounded a lot like what my father had said when he was guarding my virginity. Only now, it was my womb. I think you are a pompous ass, I told the astonished Father Taylor. You know nothing of menstruating or getting knocked up or birthing children, much less raising them. You don't even know about sex. The church says, he gulped. The men who run the church say, I interrupted. You say, you ignorant, self-absorbed, overserved men. You have nothing, nothing to offer women but grief. I will never come back to your church. As I left, I lit a last candle for the Blessed Mother. Please don't let them ever humiliate me again. Then I left the church, and the church, forever. On this day, Z says, she became a feminist. And here we see how, for better and for worse, she solidified the bond in her mind between goddess, womanhood, feminism, and the womb. And a kind of understandable scorn for anyone without those organs who dared to tell her what a woman is, does, or should be. It's a little ironic, right? Her mother-in-law loved being a grandmother, so Z was often free to take small acting and modeling jobs. She learned improv at the famed Second City. Then the family moved to New York. Fast forward through run-ins with Johnny Carson, Harry Belafonte, TV, film, theater, her husband's affair, their divorce and his remarriage, and Z is on a bus to Toronto to hitchhike across Canada. I looked back as the city diminished behind me, telling myself that this was just a three-week vacation until the boys got back from their trip with their father and his mistress. At a certain point, Z realized, quote, Men just didn't deliver love to me anymore. By 1970, she was an out and proud lesbian and witch living in Los Angeles, California. In 1971, she founded the Susan B. Anthony Coven No. 1, a women-only witch's coven. Now, if you female identifiers have ever planned a girls' night, you might understand this feeling. A lot of women, especially at the time of Budapest's early activities, were struggling to get their voices heard. Many were breaking into entirely male-dominated realms and dreaming of a place where they'd be less likely, maybe, to be interrupted, dismissed, ignored, talked over, or straight-up demeaned and abused. Patriarchy is a hard slog. It's violent. It creates a culture of fear and capitalizes on that fear. Z had seen this through a domineering father, a domineering state, and a domineering church. An oppression that she boiled down to one thing. Men. Even Wicca itself in the neo-pagan renaissance is largely credited to a man, Gerald Gardner. You heard about him in our Doreen Valiente episode. And elsewhere there are weird, ugly stories about unsettling, hierarchical, dogmatic, even exploitive New Age covens where ideas like sexual freedom were used to manipulate and abuse rather than to heal. Janet L. Jacobs did a study she named The Effects of Ritual Healing on Female Victims of Abuse, a Study of Empowerment and Transformation. Here's the abstract. This research analyzes the effects of ritual healing on women who have been victims of abuse, including incest, rape, and battering. The study was conducted through participant observation of a women's spirituality group. The focus of the analysis is on the process of empowerment as it is experienced in a ritual context that provides a means for cathartic expression as well as participant identification with female symbols of power. The findings of this study suggest that women-centered rituals are effective in reducing fear, releasing anger, increasing one's sense of power, and improving the overall mental health of those who have experienced the trauma of victimization. So it's from this perspective that Diana Wicca and Z's Coven were born. First problem. Budapest named the Coven after Susan B. Anthony, who is another great example who goes in the, well, category. Yes, Susan B. Anthony worked tirelessly as a suffragette, but her quest for women's right to vote in particular contained extremely racist rhetoric. A reaction to the prospect of black men being given the vote before white women. But Anthony was also an abolitionist, an anti-slavery activist from the age of 17. We could go back and forth all day, but what we find is another problematic ancestor who, like many, quote, heroes, did some really great stuff and said some really terrible shit. Women who rank humans in their quest for their own equality. 
women arrested for acting on beliefs. Susan B. Anthony and Jujana Budapest have a lot in common. Listen to this. Budapest will go down in history as the last person to have been arrested and tried for witchcraft in the United States. Unless, of course, the current administration reconsiders those laws. She was arrested for doing tarot reading in her own shop, the feminist Wicca, in 1975, and tried and convicted. Budapest applied the ferocity that all her years had taught her, and she appealed her conviction on the grounds that tarot readings are a form of spiritual counseling for women within the context of their religion. It took nine years in courts, but she was acquitted, and better yet, the laws against, quote, fortune-telling were struck from the California legislature. So, if you are an entrepreneurial witch, you can thank Auntie Juju for blazing that trail. The formal establishment of the SBA coven was also a reaction to the charges. Her defense team called her the first witch prosecuted since Salem. They established Diana Wicca as a bona fide religion, making her conviction explicitly unconstitutional and in violation of the Freedom of Religion Act. Z was also instrumental in the creation of Take Back the Night Marches. I remember attending a Take Back the Night March as a teen in my hometown, and even then I remember arguments over the fact that men were allowed to attend the rally, but the march itself was only for women and children. It was a symbol of women's power, what we were capable of doing and being on our own, even in the darkness, even in the face of fear. More than 20 years later, that conversation has become even more complicated, more nuanced. We as a culture are moving toward a place where binaries no longer make sense, or maybe rather back to a place where we recognize that binaries never made sense. Binaries beget hierarchies. They are an easy and lazy way to classify and label people, at best incomplete, and at worst, very, very dangerous. All women or women only sounds fine, great even in a healing context, until we have to decide what a woman is. We are all so much more than just the sum of our parts. But here's what we do know. Budapest has been explicit about her denial of trans women into her Dianic All Women's Coven. In her view, trans women do not fit the biological or experiential prerequisites for womanhood. But here's what we also know. USA Today reported that 2018 was the deadliest year for assaults against transgender Americans since the human rights campaign began keeping records. Transgender deaths by fatal violence have increased during each of the last three years. And we know that the gay panic defense is a real thing. Here's an example, and this is just one example. A trans woman named Island Nettles was beaten to death in the street by a man whose friends had mocked him for flirting with her. The killer confessed to the murder and was ultimately sentenced to just 12 years in prison. The mitigating circumstance being that Nettles was trans and her murderer just freaked out. This happened in 2013. It's not a history lesson, it's current events. It costs nothing to welcome a trans person into a coven, but to exclude them in this society is deadly. To exclude people keeps them on the outside and allows for the type of thinking that allows the panic defense. When you exclude someone, you make them a freak, which means it's totally normal and righteous to be freaked out by them, and by extension, totally normal to react to that fear with violence. Exclusion is deadly. Things came to a head for Z at a public pagan conference, Pantheacon, in 2011 when Z held a ritual for cis women only. Pagan writer Peter Dybing led a protest of Z's comments and later wrote, It is time for compassion in this discussion. Time for the trans community to sit and listen with open hearts to the pain of women who have suffered abuse at the hands of men. Time for the Dianic community to listen with open hearts to the trans community's experience of violence and exclusion. I believe all of my sisters have the ability to tap into the energy of the divine and approach these issues with respect, compassion, and the intent to heal. There is no one singular shared experience of being a woman. It is different for everyone. 
we as humans are condemned in a way to live our lives from our own perspective. But when we listen to other people and look to them for their difference of experience, this, this is how we expand our worldview past the boundaries of our own vision. It is astral projection of perception. Listening to people with differing experiences is fucking magic. We can listen and be transported out of our narrow field of view. We can connect on what we share and what we don't. We can say with eyes wide, I never thought of it that way. I was raised in a very gynocentric environment. I have a sister, my mother had a sister, my grandmother had a sister, my father moved out when I was six, so I lived most of my life surrounded almost entirely by women, and I was raised feminist. So, despite the fact that I'm six feet tall, have a deep voice, broad shoulders and body hair, thick eyebrows, androgynous clothes, and a bravado that one woman after seeing my rock and roll band said was, quote, like a man... For the record, and in her defense, English was not her first language, and she meant it as a compliment, and I took it as one. Despite the fact that I get misgendered or have my sex questioned by curious always men, I myself personally have never questioned that I'm a woman. I don't know how it feels to be trans. I don't understand what it truly means. But I don't need to understand. I don't need empathy to have compassion. We as a society need to get to a place where our differences are revered and not feared, where we can love without understanding. But I guess that's easy for me to say, the dumb luck of being born white, middle class, cis, het, Canadian. If I was hurt or sick, I had access to free health care. My public school teachers were mostly good. The system was set up, for the most part, to protect me. The world, for the most part, is my safe space. Little things that add up. I can kiss my partner in public without fear of judgment or attack. My identification matches my identity. I do not take this for granted. I respect so much the need and desire for safe spaces, especially for people who feel alienated by the world at large. A place free of judgments and devil's advocates. Free from scorn or the threat of violence. A place where you are one and not the other. I get why Zhuzhana Budapest felt compelled to create a safe space covened for women. I do not get why she feels she gets to decide what being a woman means and who qualifies. In the Holy Book of Women's Mysteries, she wrote, That is a definition of the female, a definition of womanhood, strength and beauty combined. And elsewhere, she wrote, The beauty and grace of the feminine form in all of her infinite variety. Infinite variety. As I look at her and my own problematic ancestors, I worry that all her good legacy work will be lost to her stubbornness on this one issue. Is it that same laudable stubbornness that fueled her decade-long state Supreme Court battle to legalize witchcraft that is also fueling her shameful trans exclusion? And if so, what do we make of this stubbornness? It's almost as if nothing, no one, is inherently good or inherently bad. No one. When asked about her choice to name her coven after Susan B. Anthony, Budapest said, We chose her name because she was a suffragist whom we all respected. She had her limitations. She was not perfect. And neither are we. Well, Z's darn right about that. None of us are perfect. But... What will our legacy be? And in the passing of my father, I wonder, now is he the young, powerful, athletic, handsome, charming person he was? Or the frail, confused man that he finished as? When we go, who are we? And what will our legacy be? None of us are perfect. But what will our legacy be? Zhuzhana Budapest is alive and well and continuing her practice. She is boycotting this year's Pantheacon. So what is the message here? What is her message here? To segregate ourselves until we are alone? To curate the people around us to the point where we only have a mirror? To take witchcraft and womanhood back to the dark corners because we can't agree on who is allowed in? Funny me. I thought the whole point was that we are all one. Patriarchy divides, I thought. Witchcraft connects. 
Patriarchy is competition, I thought. Witchcraft is collaboration. I told you this shit got personal, so what does it all mean for me? I went looking for the witches I'd been missing. I went digging in Hungary for my geographical Basorkai and heritage of goddess and craft and destiny and roots. And I was so excited to find this feminist force of nature and fate who had shared part of my own father's journey. Years ago, I took my dad back to his hometown in Hungary. This was after his diagnosis, after he had come to live with me. I didn't know how long I had before he'd be incapable of travel, so I took everything I had and poured it into tickets to a place I had never been. So I could go, for the first time, with him, to the place where our blood came from. Over dinner on our first night, my father's brother, my uncle, went on an insulting monologue about my mother. And the feeling I had was similar to the feeling of discovering some of Z's politics. Just why? I came all this way to see you, to find you. I was so ready to connect. Healers and scientists can harness the power of natural poisons and turn them into medicines. It's a very witchy thing to do. We make medicine from poison, art out of grief, grab calm from the inside of a storm. So what do I do with these disappointments? These poisons hid among the flowers? These thorns among the roses? I harness their sharpness and power to carve a welcome sign and hang it up on the missing witch's door and in the doorway of my heart. Come inside. Join our circle. You are welcome here. You must be a witch. Thanks for listening to the Missing Witches podcast. Be sure to come back Wednesday where I'm giving our beautiful trans witch sister Jackie Beaumont double time for her witches found. In the meantime, please light a candle for my father and blessed be.